For me, every time I look at the car, I feel that it's something very different. It is an event. From the moment you unlock it to the moment you're done, the entire process is an event. So because the car's a roadster, the moment you just think you want to take it out, the first thing you're going to do is check the weather. And you want to be very sure that you're not going to get rained on. Once that's clear, then you decide where you're going to go, what time you're going to leave, what road you're going to take, and you're always trying to avoid traffic because the car hates traffic. Once you decide that everything is a good go, you unlock the car, it beeps because it loves to beep, and then the doors open up. You sit in the car and it's really, really low. And once you look around, you can't see anything. You put your key in, you just switch on the electronics and you hear the pumps, you wait a little bit, and then you give it that last click and then you hear that engine just fire up. It is a wake up call. Lamborghinis were always recognized for being crazy and they didn't make any sense. The Merchalago to me was a bit of a departure in the sense that it was the first uh, Lamborghini that was launched under Audi's ownership. And the styling is quite different because everything is discreet. There's no wing that's just going to stick out all the time. There's no design aspect where you have aggressive bumpers and, and spoilers and just air intakes and stuff like that. Everything's discreet. And to me, it's classic. So from the start, the LP640 had a bit of a, a redesign uh, versus the original Mercilago from 2002, 2003, where the front bumper was slightly reshaped and you have a bit of a, a curvature. Going along the sides, you have the air intakes, which are vents that rise when the engine is warm. It's quite a rewarding feature to be stuck in traffic where the V12 needs a little bit more air, and then you look at your side mirrors and you see these vents rising up. And then when you start going again, they start going back down, and I love that feature. The spoiler at the back is hidden. It raises at a certain speed and then it goes back down. Most people don't even know it exists. Uh, in terms of the styling, there's no styling for style's sake. It really bugs me when you look at a supercar or any performance car that has fake openings and intakes. And with the Merchalago, there was none of that. And it's asymmetrical in its design because when they did the LP640, they upgraded the size of the engine from 6.2 liters to 6.5, and they had to upgrade the size of the oil cooler, which needed a larger intake. And so on one side of the car, you have an intake for the oil cooler, but on the other side, it's just blank, and there's no fake ventilation just for the sake of making it symmetrical. And it's these small design cues that, to me, add a bit of charm inside the car, in terms of your seating, it's kind of odd because you sit tilted towards the center of the car. It's, it's a V-shape. You're driving towards 12 o'clock. You're looking at 12 o'clock, but you're seated towards 1 o'clock, but then your pedals are towards 2 o'clock, and then your steering wheel is somewhere in between that diagram. But the steering wheel is also angled in a very odd, like, an angle, I guess, it, where it feels like you're steering a bus, but then because the engine's at the back and the steering wheel is very small, you feel like you're in a very big go-kart. It's a very odd feeling, but that's where your senses kick in because the entire experience is unlike any other. So one of the reasons I'm very passionate about this car is because I like to collect stories. A car is just an object at the end of the day. And unless it has a story behind it that you can relate to, then it's really not that interesting. 
Similarly, I have an interest in watches and watchmaking, and particular brand and watchmakers whose story sort of resonates with me is that of François Paul Journe. François Paul Journe today is considered to be the greatest living watchmaker of our time. Growing up, he wasn't the top tier student, and so his mother took a chance and decided to enroll him in watchmaking school, which he loved and was really good at, but he was very outspoken. So his teachers expelled him and they advised that he try doing something else because he would never be a great watchmaker. Fast forward in the 90s, he was a great watchmaker and he was um, developing movements for other manufacturers uh, to a point where he got fed up with the lack of appreciation. So in 1999, he decided to launch FB Journe, his own brand under his own name. Uh, at the first uh, press conference, he was asked why he decided to do so, and his answer was, and I quote, I was fed up giving pearls to swine. And that kind of relates to a similar story of Fruccio Lamborghini. Lamborghini was a company that was making tractors. And uh, he was successful enough to be able to afford a few Ferrari road cars. Uh, and he had a Ferrari 250 GT, but he wasn't very happy with the reliability of the cars. He found that the clutch in the Ferrari 250 GT was the same clutch that he was using in his tractors. So he set up a meeting with Enzo Ferrari, and Enzo being Enzo Ferrari had zero interest and told him to go back to making tractors and let him do the road cars. And he wasn't very happy about this, but it sparked a very important feud between the two and a feud that carries to this day between Lamborghini and Ferrari. So he decided to shift from making tractors to making GT cars. And uh, he hired someone by the name of Giotto Pizzarini. Pizzarini was a chief engine developer at Ferrari and he was the mastermind behind the 250 GTO. He was in the middle of developing a high performance V12 racing engine for Ferrari, but then he got into a feud with Enzo and he left and took his homework with him. And that's when he was approached by uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini. So Giotto Pizzarini ended up reworking the engine that he was making for Ferrari and he ended up with a three and a half liter V12 engine that was capable of 400 brake horsepower, which was not what Lamborghini wanted at the time because he deemed it to be too powerful for a GT car. So he took the engine, but he fired Bizzarini and the engine became known as the Bizzarini V12. Because the engine dates through five decades of the brand and was shared throughout so many different iconic models today, people recognize the Merchel logo as sort of the last true Lamborghini. It's the last of the truly sort of manual cars um, where you feel so much engagement with the steering, with the engine, with uh, just the time period that the car was designed there's a there's a very distinct redirection between the Mercilago and everything that sort of came after. So when it comes to buying a car like this, for me, I'm a purist. I like the car to be exactly the way it left, with all its faults, with all its you know things that are nice, not so nice. I just want it to be how they wanted it to be and finding that example was quite a challenge. The two things that are, in terms of shopping, are going to be if you want a Roadster or a Coupe. And I've always wanted a Coupe, and I've always wanted an orange Coupe, uh, because I had a toy car like that. Even though I wanted a Coupe, finding a, a Coupe was a bit of a, a challenge. There was one example of a, of a Roadster that I kept eyeing for about 18 months. I always told myself that one day I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna take a look at it. I've never sat in a Mercilago, I've never sat in a Lamborghini before, so why don't I go and maybe just see this in person? And I decided to go to the uh, dealership, saw the car, fell in love with it as soon as I saw it, and I decided to take a seat in it, and when I did, I looked up, there was nothing, and I looked behind me, and there's about six inches between a V12 engine and my ears, and I was like, this is kind of cool can't see anything out of here, but it's amazing. 
The second aspect is between a stick shift and an e-gear. And today there's a lot of demand for the stick shifts. For me, I grew up with the e-gear in mind. It was the only thing that I ever wanted because all of the uh, press videos of the car at the time were e-gears. I didn't grow up with stick shifts. Um, it wasn't a part of my childhood. So I have no connection to that. And in terms of rarity, you gotta buy what you like. And I'm not going to base my desire for a stick shift because people decide it's worth more. And the e-gear is not an automatic transmission. It is a semi-automatic where you have a manual transmission, but the only difference is that you don't have a third pedal because the clutch is activated via electronics. So you as a driver, choose the gear that you wanna be in and the car will take care of the rest. It'll downshift, rev match, uh, double D clutch, it'll upshift quicker than any other stick shift can. Um, and it does it so beautifully. And for the purposes of that, it's wonderful. It does have its downsides. The downsides of the e-gear is that it was not designed for stop and go traffic, trying to park the car. And I excuse all that stuff because I'm sure that when they were working on it, they didn't care about you parking the car. So for me, it doesn't matter. But once you're on the go and you got your foot down and you're nearing 8,000 RPM and you pull that paddle, that engagement is pure magic. You feel a mechanical disconnect and your body sort of jolts forward and then the gear clicks in and all of a sudden you get jolted to the back of the car and just that little thrill factor to me is worth everything. It looks kind of odd to be the owner of a car but then admire it at the same time with other people but what people don't realize is that I'm just living a dream at the end of the day. Um, I might have the keys, but I'm the same enthusiast, I'm the same admirer that I was, and I still look at the car as if it wasn't mine. My dream when I was younger was to be able to buy this car and put it in a studio or a living room where every morning I would just wake up and, and look at it. For me, it's just the admiration. And I don't think any supercar to me is a statement of one's own success. I think the fact that a 12 year old grew up with the first car manufacturer he ever could pronounce was Lamborghini. And then when he was older, he did something that might not be very smart, but he went and bought it. That's a statement of the car success. It's not of the individual because at the end of the day, owners change, but the car is still the car.